If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground, I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. In this episode, Bob Wenzel of War Road invites us into his workshop where he shares the art of building guitars with a father and son. Let's paint her up. And, uh, so, yep, you want your, I'll give you a white pencil and then. Uh, okay, well, my name is Bob Wenzel and I live in War Road, Minnesota. And what we got going on here this summer is a guitar making class. It's. Uh, basic training, you might say, because it's very intense and it goes through the summer months. And I've got a father and son team, Gary and Charlie Peterson from Brainerd, and uh, they're both doing well. Actually, I'm mostly a violin maker. I started out making guitars when I lived in Mexico, and then I found a violin making school, which I attended. And from then on, I made mostly violins, violas and cellos. And it's been recent that I've just started to delve back into guitars. Guitars are a little easier than, than violins, so it wasn't uh, much of a learning curve. I think I got it under wraps now. But there were a few things that are different, the neck and the dovetail and so on. Oh, people ask me that, how did I get into making instruments? It wasn't anything that I'd say I was born to do. It was something that I figured I should do. And that came about through a series of events uh, called life. And when I grew up a little bit, I thought, well, that might be a good career for me. So when you start, we make ours with a mold. You can do it without a mold, but a mold keeps you uh, grounded as to where everything goes and lies and so on. So we use a mold. It's just three pieces of three quarter inch plywood with a guitar shape cut out, sanded, varnished. Then the next step is to bend your ribs inside and you use a hot pipe with water to bend your ribs. <laughs> okay. Here. 
We're bending the wood to, to fit the shape of the guitar. Then it goes in the mold. This, this, uh, this type of guitar uh, isn't the same as our mold. It's a, this is an orchestra model. It's a little smaller than that, so I'm just gonna go off of the pattern here. That's an orchestra model uh, over here. They're smaller than dreadnoughts. And as a result, your scale length is shorter. So finger pickers like this a lot because they use a lot of chords. And if you can't reach from the second fret to the sixth fret comfortably, you should probably have a smaller scale length. That's an orchestra model. Gary has a dreadnought. His dad is making a dreadnought. They're bigger. You, you got more bass in there because there's more air volume in there. Even parlor guitars nowadays are making a comeback. You've got this size here. They're called parlor guitars because they used to sit in parlors and they didn't need the volume. These are actually making a comeback nowadays. Little parlor guitars, they're easier to play. You're not stretching uh, for those chords. But you sacrifice a certain tone. Like with dreadnoughts, you've got the low end covered. You've got all that air in there and you're pumping it. Uh, with these, they're a little more trebly because of the air volume. So it's not just volume though, it's a timber or timbre uh, of sound. So your quality of sound is what people pay you for. I mean, anybody can play a loud guitar or a soft guitar or whatever, but it's gotta have those overtones in there to give it some quality. It mainly goes on what style do you play? Or if you want an all around guitar, I, I suppose that's why people get a dreadnought most of the time. They've got the big boomy sound in a dreadnought, whereas for finger pickers, that's not always desirable. Um, for finger pickers, you want maybe a shorter scale length, which means a smaller guitar. Basically, that's all there is to it. Um, style of play. There's some different pieces of wood, mostly tops. And you can check to see how good the piece of wood is by flexing it and by tapping it. And you listen for that ring, how long the duration is. What kind of wood you choose should go with the kind of guitar the person who's playing it wants as far as sound quality. After you bend it to fit the mold, you glue in the end blocks. This is a little different design here, this end block. That's actually the top. On classical guitars, that would be on the bottom. But anyway, so then you glue the end blocks in, and then after that come the linings. So then you put the, put the linings in all around. Well, I've been teaching about 12 years. What got me into teaching? Well, uh, for starters, my wife, uh, she got me into teaching lessons as far as guitar lessons and violin lessons. And I really enjoy that. The kids are great. I teach a couple of days a week. The rest of the time I spend on instruments. I can do both. I can teach and make while I'm teaching them. So I prefer what I'm doing. It's really good to pass things along. And I like the camaraderie. Most instrument makers are easygoing, well, if I may, uh, nice people. My wife, she won't talk to me anymore about making instruments, so it's, it's good to have someone around with a little interest. I mean, she's interested, don't get me wrong, but that's all I talk about. You don't want to build when it's humid because if it comes up to a country like this in the wintertime, things are going to happen that won't be good. So I keep everything in here. After, after the boys are done working, uh, we bring all the wood in here so it, it acclimates to this humidity. Better to build dry than build wet. I've also got an exhaust fan here for spraying. This turns into a little spray booth uh, for spraying down a guitar if you can't do it outside. And on days like this, you couldn't. And uh, I keep my electronics in here. I have a scale here that weighs things. Uh, if you want to weigh, like, for example, the bridge or uh, certain parts of the guitar. So weight has a lot to do with how the guitar functions. Uh, it's just uh, uh, physics. If the object is heavy, it's going to be harder to move. But it has to be strong enough, dense enough, whatever, to withstand the string. So it's. Uh, Kind of a catch-22, and then this is a strobe tuner. I use that to fine-tune the guitars when you 
put a saddle in there, that's a piece of bone that goes across here that the strings ride over. You want to have that saddle so all the strings are intoned. And this is just a little piece of electronic equipment that helps me do that. You could do it by ear as well, I suppose. I don't use too much electronics, but that's one thing I do use. This thing here, it's got UV uh, bulbs in there. And when I varnish a cello or a violin or a viola, whatever, um, that I use an oil varnish on, so you have to oxidize the oil. So you can either leave it outside or you can put it in a booth like this and that helps to dry it. So once it's oxidized, it gets a little harder. Uh, and that's oil varnish. With lacquer, uh, you don't need this box. Lacquer works on evaporation, so that just evaporates. Yeah, I'm just checking the uh, sharpness of, of this joiner plane here. That's got to be sharp enough to shave with. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should do that. But anyway, if you don't have sharp tools, you might as well forget it. Because you don't have the control you need to do this kind of work. And the sharp tools allows you to take those fine cuts. Very important. My name is Charlie Peterson. I'm up here in World at a guitar school with my son, who is also in the school. My name is Gary Peterson at uh, Bob Wenzel's uh, little studio here. And he, Bob is teaching me how to build a, an acoustic guitar. I started getting interested in guitars. I've try, been trying to play for a long time. and Many years ago, I bought a guitar kit that I never got to put together. And my son got interested in guitars and building. And uh, so I looked into the, the school and we decided to both come up here. And I chose to come to Bob's studio on account of it's in Minnesota. And I just wanted to keep it at home. I figured a lot of good artists come from Minnesota and I figured this would be more one-on-one uh, -on -one and uh, someone I could refer to in the future you know, to befriend. My interest in guitar making, I guess, would stem from being young. I've always liked music. I, I, I love musical instruments. And I like woodworking. And instruments, to me, have been a source of peace of mind, security, like. i kind of been practicing music since probably 14, I guess. And my father has always played music. My grandfather kind of entertained people, and I guess I grew up watching my grandfather entertain people in a sense. It seems like the, the more you get interested in playing a guitar, you start winding up buying more guitars. <laughs> and then eventually you want to own a real good one, and you start to realize that handmade guitars are probably better than factory produced guitars. Just the interest in knowing how they go together, you know, as opposed to just grabbing one and playing it, knowing what goes into them. When I bought the kit, I also started to read a lot of books on building a guitar to put the kit together. And I realized that just doing it out of a book, I wouldn't be able to do it without some personal help and instruction. Bob's process in teaching me works very well because it's one-on-one -on -one and I relate with Bob very well. I think Bob kind of sticks to himself a little bit and, and so do I, but his, his process uh, is good, uh, step by step, and uh, he tells me why we're doing something, why we're using the woods we're using, why we're going to change something from, a say, a pattern that I've acquired, you know. And I felt if I was to go to a Votech or a college down south, it's not going to be personable. I just understand so much more after working with him. And it seems to be the way I would have to do it, you know. He's got my back, in a sense. That's, that's the biggest thing with Bob, it, it is uh, any other schools, you couldn't go there and just hit up a teacher and ask things, and, you know. And Bob, Bob will be there for life, I feel someone that I can talk to about guitar building, something new I've come across to share with him. And I think it'll work both ways, kind of.
I wanted to personally make something by my hands and play it. Yeah, I don't think I could get any satisfaction out of buying the best of any guitars. I, I think making one was the way I would have to go. This is the seventh session of about a 12-week school, three days a week. Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays for eight hours a day. I prefer the three days a week just to clear my head. And the fact is I, I still have to work and I still have to make ends meet at home. So if I was to come up here for the full term, five days a week or whatnot, and just strictly work on the guitar, I think it would get overwhelming and kind of start burning myself out. Because I take in so much in the three days, kind of an overload for me. Other people probably can handle that, but for me, uh, three days is probably good. It's nice to have that break to go back to our home, which isn't that far. It's only a three or four hour drive. And then catch up on all the things that are necessary at your home. Three days a week is, is plenty and it takes a lot of concentration and that's just about right. Being my father is doing it and we both can lean on each other now. He'll have questions for me and I'll have questions for him. And I think between the two of us that, that we can accomplish it. To be so much into it, it's, it's not all that long a time I'm spending here. They that we're building a guitar, so that's, I don't know, it's stressful, I guess. So I think uh, being my dad's doing it, it's a good thing. Him and I, uh, yeah, we have our days, I guess. Uh, so it, it'll bring him and I closer together, I guess. My dad and I have been pretty distant in life. So maybe this will bring us together. And that's basically why it's good for the two of us to be doing this. Yeah. Chance for him and I to uh, get to know each other. <laughs> that's another reason my dad thought that that would be a good thing for me to do because I'm kind of a perfectionist. So he figured it'd be right up my alley there. And at my age, it's much more important for him to learn the process of building a guitar than it is for me. Me, I'm, I'm doing it just kind of accompanying him up here and, and to get my, my old kit together, which Bob said he could help me do. But the main purpose is for my son to learn because he loves guitars, he loves music, and he loves woodworking. And I thought it would be a real good combination for him to get into. My recommendation, if somebody really wanted to build their own guitar. You've got to have a lot of patience. <laughs> it's, a, it's not like building a table. <laughs> That's my main reason seeking Bob out is, uh, you know, my father and I drove up here and met him and the first day we, even before I met him on the telephone, I knew he'd be the one to come to, you know. But the fact is for me, he has a passion for music. He, he likes to play music whenever he can and he loves it. So it's nice that it's not down in, uh, Arizona or Alabama or uh, it's nice that it's not far, far away like that. I play all the instruments I make. I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm an expert at them, but I play enough to, to determine what sound there is. And that's all really we have to do. I, I think a lot of instrument makers are frustrated musicians, but if you have a good ear and, and you you have some experience, you can detect certain things just with your ear. There's a lot of people nowadays that use electronics to tune this, to tune that in uh, instrument making. Some people have oscilloscopes and <laughs> hologram machines, you name it. But I think it's best to keep things simple. You should have a good plane, number one. A uh, nice joiner plane, 22 inches long. I like that. And a nice block plane and a good knife. When I lived in Mexico, that's, that's all there was. That was back in 74, I think. But back then, there wasn't this renaissance that's going on now with, with the instrument making. So it was really hard to find anyone to get any information out. There was no computer. Everything's on the computer now, which is great. I like that. But back then, it was a little different. And, and I can't even recall how I found that school. but. That's the only thing I could find that I could afford. And it was eight bucks a year for the tuition. Of course, the teachers took a lot of siestas, but 
you got by. And I also studied with a guitar maker when I was down there, an individual guitar maker who taught me how to make classical guitars. So I was doing both while I was there. I think it was part of the hippie movement, back to the land type of thing, rejection of technology, you know, living a simple life. Those philosophies, I think, were an influence. In my own case, it was just a matter of taking the next step towards what I wanted to do. I, I was probably influenced in that manner as well. I still feel that way. So it's been a wonderful life. This guitar is near the end. One of the last things I do is I fret it. So you, you can buy a fret wire like this. It's made up of nickel and another alloy. It keeps it soft, but hard enough to where it's not gonna dent in so much. So this fingerboard comes from a piece of ebony like so, and then you, you, cut, you cut the slots. Now that, that works on a rule of 18, uh, devised by some Greek cat. So you can arc and arc and arc, and the more you arc, so that's your musical, it goes in half steps on the, on the guitar, so F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, and so on. So in the half step increments done by a mathematical formula which I couldn't do if you asked me. I've got a ruler that's got it on there, so I just, I just draw that, and then after that's all glued, you, you pound these frets in. So they have little barbs on the tang here that drive into the wood. So you saw your slot, and then I've got a chasing hammer, but they just tap in like that. Tap, 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 all the way along. But before you do that, you have to put an arch on the fingerboard. What I've got on this one is a 16 degree arch. But here's all the arches you could do. The common ones are 16, 20, 12. Martin guitars are 12, and that's, that's an arch like that, as opposed to a, a 16 arch like, like that. So that one's a little more curved, this one less. Depending on who's playing the guitar. So that's one way you can, um, like a lot of people wonder, well, that's a nice Taylor guitar, that's a nice Martin guitar, and it is, and they are. Well, how, how come I can't just get one of those instead of having a handmade guitar? Well, there's subtle differences. That's one of them. You have all the control, whereas the factory does things, you know, by rote. So in this case, this person wanted a 16-degree arch on the fingerboard, so that's what he got. After you pound the frets in, then you have to clip the ends, and I just clip it using this, just come along and clip, snip them off, and now I'm in the process of filing the, the ends flush with the fingerboard, because if you ran your finger along there, you'd, you'd, you'd start to bleed pretty soon. You have to be a bit of an acoustician to make instruments. You have to understand acoustics and physics and chemistry a little bit because you make the varnish. The physics part of it is, is the acoustics and other things, but I mean, you have to do that and understand that so you can make better ones. It's all a crapshoot in a way because every piece of wood is different, even out of the same log. So you have to treat everything individually. This is where we have it over the factory guitars where they snap them out. I mean, they make nice factory guitars now. Martin and Taylor are nice, and there's others out there, a lot of them. But they can't take the time, they can't afford to take the time to do what we do. So it's time consuming. Right now, I like guitars. I'm having fun with guitars. Guitars are easier. You're working with a flat surface. Uh, there's no carving like there is in violin making. You're carving a shape, you're sculpting. It's a lot more challenging. You can inlay a guitar, yes, that, that's very skillful. I, I don't ever plan on inlaying a whole bunch of stuff. You take about twice as long to inlay as you do to make the guitar, so I'm more interested in how it sounds, how to get the sound out, so that's where my focus is. And playability, of course. Well, the importance is that we have a computer up here. We have machinery right here. Don't get me wrong, I like computers, I use them now and then. And I have a lot of power tools as well. But, but I think we're forgetting about these things and this. We go and buy things at Walmart. We just buy everything, you know. Uh, there's so much more satisfaction and meaning in something you do by hand.
Thanks for watching. Join us again next week on Common Ground. If you have an idea for a common ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3014. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People, November 4th, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.